are we going to talk about? Um, well, here's the, uh, the agenda. Wanted to first define what public opinion is and then how we understand the implications for policy. And then also relate this to drone warfare. And in doing so, I want to canvas what I've identified in my research as two generations of public opinion research. And then finally, identify gaps and what's on the horizon in terms of key questions that I think scholars and practitioners ought to think about when we explore the implications of public attitudes, whether they're support, whether it's approval or legitimacy on the policy for drone warfare that these countries adopt. So public opinion. So a really good definition of public opinions provided by Walter Lippmann in 1922. He defined it as sort of pictures that the public has as in their heads regarding current affairs or events that they'll act upon when they gain uh, engage political officials. And more recently, our colleagues at Harvard, uh, namely Joshua Kurtzer and his colleague, um, Thomas Zeitzoff, have identified this as well, right? And so in empirical research using the best of American statistics, they identify individuals that carry these meaningful sort of orientations about public, um, current affairs uh, around their heads with them that informs how they engage the public. So now we have a baseline for what public opinion is. So what does this mean in terms of the implications for policy, uh, especially in terms of countries sort of use of force more generally? And what I see in the literature clearly is these two positions that scholars adopt when adjudicating the implications of public opinion for political officials use of force abroad. On the one hand is this notion that public opinion can actually shape foreign policies by encouraging political officials to make certain decisions for the use of force abroad that align with broad citizenry sort of expectation. And so this is known as the sort of bottom-up approach, if you will, uh, to public opinion. Writing in the same year, uh, John Zoller in 1992 says, well, hold on a second. He actually argues that elite preferences or manipulations by uh, elites for public narrative and framing is really the most consequential sort of mechanism responsible for shaping political officials' use of force abroad. And in the context of drones, I think what we see is an exacerbation of these countervailing tendencies for bottom up and top down interpretations, especially because you've, as you've learned from James today and in, in previous sort of days of this course, drones have special qualities uh, that differentiate them from additional military equipment that also afford similar standoff on the battlefield, artillery, bombers, uh, and jets. And so we know drones can loiter for prolonged periods of time, they extend operational reach, and they have a punitive advantage of really balancing military objectives against civilian casualty protection while surgically removing targets. I mean, this is the most appealing aspect of drones. And so the tension between the bottom up and the top down sort of directionality, if you will, a public opinion raises for me and for a lot of other people within the field of political science and public opinion research, a key question. As it relates to drones, that's it, that, that is, what are the implications of public opinion for political officials' use of drone strikes? Now, of course, if you follow the literature, and I know a lot of you do, this has been a question that's been studied at length, uh, great length, uh, really by folks like my supervisor here at Cornell, uh, Sarah Kreps, Michael Horowitz at Penn and others. But when you take a real hard look at the literature, what you find is a lack of consensus on the causal impact of public attitudes on countries' drone policies. And in looking at the literature, I think this is a function of three different factors that have shaped the broader arc of research for the better part of two decades since President George W. Bush inaugurated the use of drone strikes, officially at least, in 2002 in, in Yemen. And so these three factors I'm gonna talk about going forward are, are these. First is that scholars focus on different audiences, uh, which makes sense, but the implications here from a, an empirical perspective is that the outcomes could be different, are different. The second factor that shapes this research tradition, if you will, are conflicting assumptions about the directionality of public opinion. And so I just talked about this, this is the bottom up and top-down perspectives. Then finally, we know from years of social psychology research that there are core beliefs and values, what we call micro-foundations, that underline public attitudes. Ironically, very few people, one, study these in terms of just public opinion generally, 
And then those that do haven't really focused against them in terms of drone strikes in particular. And so I think that these three axes of audience, directionality of public opinion, and micro foundations are important to understand uh, shifts as well, because over time, what they've done is framed, it seems to me, several different generations of public opinion research. And we're going to talk about those right now. But before kind of differentiating between the first and the second generation, as I call them, I do want to identify that the body of research for public opinion and drone warfare has several consistencies. And these consistencies are really methodological consistencies, which I think contextualizes what we do in the military. And we ought to be uh, aware of that. The first is that most people who focus on public opinion research and drones will use what we call survey experiments. And in doing so, what they attempt to do is to vary an independent variable, let's say the country conducting the strike and international approval, for instance, and the implications of this on shaping public attitudes for strikes. The second sort of consistency within the literature is more of a focus on attitudes of support and approval versus affect or emotion, or even public perceptions of legitimacy. And this is based upon an assumption, which is often implicit, that approval and support are really the lenses through which the public views uh, foreign policy and the use of force abroad. Again, it's an implicit assumption that hasn't empirically been identified, and we'll disentangle this uh, going forward. And then finally, there's really a focus, more or less, across both generations of research on public opinion and drone warfare on this notion of US counterterrorism scenarios. And there are good reasons for this that we can discuss, but there, it comes with trade-offs. And most problematically, the trade-off is in terms of a European context. So European countries have attempted to balance an identification with the United States against policy differences, clear policy differences over drones that has resulted in one, uneven capability development and adoption. And then two, to the extent that countries have adopted and used these drones actively, really only one case, France beside beyond its own borders and region, they've done so in a very different way in terms of use and constraint of drones. And all you have to do is really take a look at the polling data for the last several decades. And so on the left there, from the Pew uh, Research uh, Center, you'll see a poll that was taken in 2015, which is emblematic of uh, polls in previous years that a majority of Americans, I think up to about 60%, support these strikes abroad. Uh, and really you see a mediating effect of a political sort of ideology with republicanism or conservatism being pretty high when you take a look at how this uh, data is stratified at, at different levels. Whereas if you take a look at the, the right side, this is the sort of drone club countries within Europe. And of course we would expect UK and France support, but even there, the sort of support level is less than in the United States. And then it just kind of precipitously declines as you go down the chain to, to Spain. And so there's clear differences cross-nationally that when you focus on U.S. counterterrorism scenarios and only polling U.S. public, you're going to miss out on. And this is the point in trying to ban the first and second generations of drone warfare scholarship. So let's kind of move on uh, to what that looks like uh, at this point. So as I stated previously, in my estimate, these generations of scholarship are, are demarcated by the audience, are demarcated by the directionality of public opinion, and are demarcated by a focus or not on what we call micro foundation. So these things bound the sort of scholarship on public opinion and drone warfare. For the first generation, which we're going to go into right now, the focus was clearly on US citizens as a barometer for US, for a global public opinion rather, was a focus on a bottom up interpretation of public opinion and then a lack of attention to these micro foundations. And you get some key references there uh, on this chart that I'm gonna talk about um, right now. So first is a focus on the US uh, sort of public uh, to tap into broader global trends in attitudes on drone strikes. This has been the trend I think it's a fair case to be made, at least in earlier research, because one, the US uh, was and is the most prolific user of drones globally for high-end counterterrorism operations. But of course, we know intuitively that this comes with a clear trade-off. And these trade-offs have been, you can't tap into cross-national variation of um, public attitudes. 
Another point here has been the way that the data reflects our interest as scholars and practitioners and how these capabilities are being used. And so the case of the United States, there's just a lot more data that's been collated and curated over time to tap into, especially the unintended consequences of strikes. Whereas in the case of European countries, there's very few of any, uh, well, I think drone wars out of the UK um, sort of databases is to do the same for not just Britain's strikes abroad, but also French strikes abroad. It's very hard to get this uh, sort of data, right? The second point here is an assumption within the first generation of scholarship, if I, as I've called it, that political officials and their preferences for the use of force and strikes abroad are actually shaped by public opinion. But yet nowhere in this empirical research is that actually shown empirically. And I'm going to walk through a couple key texts that I think you ought to be aware of that bound, especially the second point about directionality of public opinion. So first is an article by Krebs, my supervisor, that finds that Americans generally su support strikes abroad, but that perceptions of support um, are mostly aligned with the compatibility or perceived compatibility of strikes with international law. And that international law or perceptions of alignment with international law uh, can really uh, moderate the effect at, at different magnitudes. When I say international law, I'm mostly referring to international humanitarian law uh, that governs sort of the use of force uh, in conflict. So distinction, proportionality, necessity, things that you're well aware of. Uh, this was consistent with the finding from Schneider and McDonald in 2016 from the Center of New American Security. If we walk over a couple of years, Kreps and Wallace, they also find that International non-government organizations can actually shape public attitudes for strikes, especially when criticisms of these strikes relate more to legality of the operations versus the effectiveness. So how many terrorists did I kill? Uh, how many attacks did I prevent? Horowitz in 2016, writing in the same year, also finds that these public attitudes for strikes in the US context at least are contextual, meaning that they shift based upon the degree to which they protect soldiers. And so really what we're tapping into right now is a key moral norm that means that US officials ought to use these capabilities to protect soldiers uh, in combat. And then finally, we get um, this piece uh, by Bradley and Klein in 2021 that shows a successful strike can increase presidential approval despite a staggering economy. And so what you see here is some marginal support to this notion of a, of a diversionary use of force for domestic political gain. And so this small uh, snapshot or cross-section of literature is important because it benchmarks, I believe, how most scholars within American political science, at least, understand U.S. attitudes for strikes. But it does share a common theme, which is to say that none of these scholars really addresses how or to what extent or through what mechanisms the public can actually influence political officials for the use of strikes abroad. In other words, we're kind of hanging our hat on this notion of a bottom-up directionality of public opinion without really proving that this is the case. And then finally, the notion of micro foundations. Again, there's an assumption here within the first generation that there are core beliefs and attitudes, but these aren't really torn apart and adjudicated explicitly. To the extent it takes place, what you often see is an identification of core, what we call mediating conditions, like the degree to which I have a conservative political ideology, uh, how old I am, uh, things of this nature that we can show through statistical analysis have an effect on the outcome. But nowhere do we see in this body of literature uh, uh, really uh, the degree to which um, a core value or belief would have an overall implication for your effect, right? So we'll quickly walk through the, the second generation here, then open it up for questions as I close. And so the second generation, as opposed to the first, focuses on adjudicating uh, public attitudes in a cross-national context, in really a European context, mostly because of a proliferating use by large countries, but also an acknowledgement that James talked about a lot in his research of countries adopting drones, the TB2 Barakatar or others within their own borders as it relates to managing political violence. And I'll talk more about these evolving patterns later. The second point here is an attempt to reconcile bottom up and top down explanations for public opinion. 
And then finally is a more specific focus on abstracting through unique sort of statistical methods, this notion of, of micro uh, foundations. And so what we see here first is that scholars are clearly more interested in recognizing the pitfalls of this focusing or essentializing public attitudes to US beliefs on these operations. And one key example here would be an article by being in colleagues in 2018, he relies on the 2013 Transatlantic Trend Survey to show that there are inconsistent beliefs among publics of especially European uh, drone producing countries or drone adopting countries. And he also recognizes, they also recognize that the reason for this are quite complicated in a domestic sort of political context. But they do find one sort of consistent, I guess you would call it mediating effect here. And that is that publics within Europe and these drone producing countries, and I just showed the chart earlier of who this consists of, really have a strong preference for uh, transatlantic security ties with the United States. And as such, this has a significant moderating effect on the approval of these countries for especially U.S. drone strikes abroad. So this is one example of the sort of second generation scholarship. Another example is an article by Lushenko et al., well, I guess that'd be me, uh, recently on the use of French drones in Western Africa, namely the country of Mali. And my colleagues and I focus on France because it's a useful litmus test for non-US perspectives on these strikes. And we fielded an original survey experiment of about, I think, 1800 respondents, 900 in America, 900 in France, that resulted promisingly enough in cross-nationally consistent findings, which were this. First is that um, international approval by way of both sets of respondents is associated with higher public support and greater perceived legitimacy for operations. We also find that the emphasis is on international law or perceived compliance with international law for these operations, suggesting that there's a shared belief cross-nationally in multilateralism for not just instrumental reasons, uh, burden sharing, in other words, but also because of normative considerations that we tap into as well. Another example is a piece that I just wrote as well uh, with colleagues here at Cornell, based upon another survey experiment, again, in America and France, that shows that there are significant moderating effects for the country conducting the strike uh, down to its use and constraint. And so evolving patterns of drone warfare globally by way of understanding tactical and strategic uses coupled with unilateral and multilateral constraints will have significant effects on a public's understanding of legitimacy for these operations. What about directionality of public opinion? The second generation of scholarship, if you're with me, attempts to adjudicate in unique ways the directionality of public opinion by conceptualizing or reconceptualizing rather drone warfare as a leader driven practice. And so I think you maybe read one piece uh, which would have been in mind on the sort of US president's use of drone warfare, which is to say that public opinion is endogenous to US presidents. In other words, presidents in the best of sort of political science research in, the, in at least domestic political uh, systems or, or democratic political systems are constituted by public opinion and then reconstituted themselves. And so this is a key assumption that really kind of tracks with a broader revolution in international relations scholarship, what we call the behavior revolution, to understand the implications of individuals and leaders on foreign policy. And so I adopt it within my research to say that drone warfare is not a function of an interagency or bureaucratic process, not um, actually conducted by states as such, it's conducted or authorized by, by individuals. So this is one useful way to adopt that assumption uh, by way of drone warfare research. And then finally is this notion of micro foundations. And so the core beliefs and attitudes that undergird um, public perceptions of legitimacy, for instance. And so what you see in this second generation of scholarship is an adoption of a unique statistical method called causal mediation analysis, which is designed, and I won't go into the details, but it's designed to tease out these mechanisms or micro foundations that may mediate public attitudes in terms of approval support and legitimacy. I've thrown up one sort of leading article that does this by Fisk et al. in 2019. 
And what they do in a cross-national sort of French, Turkish, and U.S. context is study the implications of affect or emotions, specifically anger and fear as these key micro foundations for the public support for strikes, uh, again, in a cross-national context. The, uh, the results are rather mixed, so I can talk about those in greater detail, but it's promising because it broadens the aperture of our focus on these mechanisms, micro foundations. Um, another sort of approach here was uh, the article I just flashed up that I wrote uh, recently for Brookings Institute that doesn't focus on a vector emotion as such, but takes a look at what we call these uh, cold or cognitive mechanisms. Uh, for instance, uh, support to the use of force abroad by great powers, uh, support to great powers, global managerial responsibilities for security, um, support to international law, uh, morality, uh, which is to say uh, reduction of civilian casualties during these operations. And so these sort of cognitive sort of mechanisms we can show in this piece or do show in this piece, piece have a mediating effect for U.S. and, and uh, French attitudes. And so generally, this is the broad arc of the first and second generations of, of scholarship. So having said that, where do I see um, the ability to continue to carry through momentum on these literatures? Well, I think there's a couple different uh, areas that we can focus on. First is that I stated earlier that most people focus on support and approval as attitudes for drone strike and public opinion. I think that if we believe as not just in the military, these practitioners uh, ourselves, but also political officials that legitimacy is really important to the sustainability of these operations, then we ought to identify legitimacy as a key dependent variable within our empirical research. And when I define legitimacy in my research, it's really the subjective beliefs that people have in the appropriateness of wartime conduct. The other is this notion of civilian casualties. And so there are these intuitive, but yet non-falsifiable deductions that people make about the effect that civilian casualties have on public perceptions for legitimate strikes. And one example is my colleague Mitt Reagan from Georgetown just published this great book, if you're interested. It's called Drone Strike, Analyzing the Impacts of Targeted Killing. It benchmarks 20 years of literature. In here, I think on page 286, he states that avoiding civilian harm and I quote, may be important uh, to the perceived legitimacy of strikes, unquote. I think this is an intuitive thought, I would agree with it, but yet there's really not a lot of empirical study that bears that out. And in doing so kind of disentangles the degree of civilian casualties that would have significant effects on public attitudes of support, approval, uh, and legitimacy. And then finally is this notion of attitudes of the intervened. And so we often take a look at citizens and respondents in the empirical research survey uh, experiments, that is, um, we take a look at the spot respondents from the targeting country. So the United States uh, or France, very rarely do we flip this dynamic on its head and take a look at, at uh, respondents attitudes from those who are in the targeted country. But yet we make these broad assumptions that when strikes go awry and they create mistakes, just like the box strike in Afghanistan on the 26th of, I guess, August of this last year, that resulted in 10 dead civilians, women and children, and not the Islamic State terrorists, that there's going to be blowback in terms of greater terrorist recruitment and, and, and so on. But this is an empirical question, and we ought to study it. To the extent people have, we have these ethnographic studies, which are really helpful, but they're beleaguered by a lot of endogeneity, or what we call bias. And so there's selection effects, and you're really only talking about people who are directly or indirectly affected. And so then you can't in terms of reverse causation, kind of figure out if they're what we call um, ex ante beliefs or ex post facto beliefs. In other words, did I not like drone strikes before I was affected or because I was affected did I not like drone strikes? And so when we couple these ethnographic and empirical studies together, I think we get a better handle on really the attitudes of people within the intervened countries, as I called it. All right, I'm gonna close up here in just a couple minutes and open up for questions. I think that the momentum for public opinion research can go in different directions as well, and one of two directions. The first is this notion of evolving patterns of drone strikes globally that James has talked a lot about in his work. And so the question for me becomes, to what degree do emerging patterns of drone warfare moderate the public's perceptions of legitimate strikes? There are a variety of ways to understand evolving patterns. This is the way I do so. I understand 
shifts in the use of drone warfare in terms of two key variables. One is the use and one is the constraint of drone warfare. Those in this room will understand from a doctrinal perspective that operations can be used tactically or strategically, right? And so drones can be used like a patroller raid, or they can also be used to achieve broader military and political objectives, as is, is the case for like decapitating a network. On the other hand, and much less attention has been paid to in the literature, is this notion of constraint. And so countries can actually adopt unilateral constraints or self-imposed constraints, or multilaterally externally imposed constraints. The former consists of things like President Obama's near certainty standard for no civilian casualties during strikes in undeclared theater of operations, namely Pakistan. This was a set of regulations that was adopted by the country itself and centralized within the White House, a unilateral constraint. On the other hand, the multilateral constraint really comes down to international approval through the United Nations, as well as regional approval through these key bodies, like let's say the Shahal Five in Mali. When you bring these two variables together, I posit, you get these unique patterns of drone warfare. I focus in my research on the sort of over the horizon strikes, but also the juridical strikes. Over the horizon would be US strikes in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen, the strategic use of this asset with nothing more than unilateral sort of constraints, whereas French strikes are really governed by the sort of multilateral oversight provided by the UN, and they also use it more or less as a patrol or a raid. And so I think it's really interesting to ask the question to what extent, if we believe these patterns empirically occur in the world, they actually can moderate public perceptions of legitimacy. The final point in terms of where the literature should go is this question of legitimacy of international society. And so in a recent book, I posit that there are implications for drone warfare on public perceptions of global order and legitimacy thereof. In other words, what are the implications of drone warfare for the perceived legitimacy of global order? There's a useful framework that my colleagues and I sort of promulgate within the first chapter about the hierarchical nature of international society, sovereign equality of states, international law as the institutional structure of global order, and then finally, the diffusion of capabilities is a key marker of the global distribution of power. And we say that there's key contradictions both within and across these axes that drone warfare can imply, but yet we don't really study this empirically. To the extent we give any sort of answer, we kind of give broad directionality on legitimacy outcomes of drone warfare. I think it'd be quite fascinating for other scholars to pick up the sort of mantle in the attempt to adjudicate through survey experiments and empirically test how these drone strikes actually can affect our understanding of the legitimacy of global order. And there are a variety of ways that one could do this. Uh, you could do simply a cross-national survey experiment as I've talked about. You could conceptualize these key pillars as micro foundations in themselves, or you could adopt what we call a conjoint design, which basically attempts to adjudicate the independent effect of preferences on numerous features of this complicated concept of drone strikes. And so in this case, you would get a really unique statistic called the average marginal component effect, which captures the value of one of these pillars relative to everything else. And so in about, I guess, 30 minutes, I've kind of sketched out, as I understand, public opinion as it relates to drone warfare in terms of these two generations of research. I've kind of tore these apart a little bit and then provided us a way to think about what's on the horizon in terms of legitimacy, civilian casualties, as well as attitudes of the intervened. And finally, these two questions of global order. Uh, so anyway, I'll open it up for questions. Hopefully you guys are still awake over there. <laughs>